Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the sixth floor for this very intimate setting tonight. Um, tonight's very special. This is a film screening of the award-winning documentary, A Ripple of Hope. This is a powerful film directed and produced by Dr. Donald Boggs. And this is the museum's last public program associated with our summer photography exhibit, Rebel Spirits, which closes on Labor Day. After, after tonight's film, there will be a discussion led by curator Stephen Fagan and Dr. Boggs. So please don't leave, stick around for a really compelling conversation about the making of this film, the intent behind the production, and its ongoing impact today. And we have somebody here from Annapolis. I'm just going to bring, uh, bring up, um, Carolyn, you were in Indianapolis at the time of the speech. Um, so that's very, very special. Thank you so much for coming here. But I'd like tonight to give a special shout out to all our educators here. And welcome back to school for the new academic year. Without you, um, we wouldn't be making a deep impression on our youth and our future leaders. So um, I want to also thank the staff who have worked really hard to develop a special lesson plan about the impact of Robert Kennedy's speech um, in April, um, on April the 4th and April the 5th right after the death of um, Dr. Martin Luther King. So this is for you, and we hope that you will begin to take advantage of these incredible resources that we're compiling, and we do need your feedback. So please don't ever be shy about speaking up about how we can better serve you and how we can encourage you to bring your schools here and how we can develop programs that um, will teach kids about their local history. So. Um, Thank you all very much for coming. I want to thank Dr. Boggs and his wife, and Stephen Fagan, our curator, who will be leading the discussion afterwards. So Dr. Boggs, please join me in welcoming him up to the stage. What a joy to be here tonight. Uh, my wife, Sharon, and I have had such a wonderful day here at the museum. You are so fortunate to have this facility here and especially to have the people, uh, some of whom work at the museum, they are, they are just wonderful. They've been so hospitable to us, and uh, the barbecue pulled pork uh, <laughs> a mile or so away was quite good, too. So, uh, Thank you, Nicola, for having me, and Stephen for doing the interview a little bit later. A Ripple of Hope is uh, the story of a moment in American history uh, at, the, at the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., April 4, 1968. And it, after that assassination, as many of you well know, the streets of the United States uh, were soon almost war zones. There's a short clip of that in the film near the end of the film in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm sorry, in Chicago, Illinois. And I, I struggled mightily looking at this footage. Uh, and it, trying to select something that would really represent what was happening to a younger generation, particularly, that had, that had no idea. And so you, you'll see a, a soldier or two, military, National Guard, and Jeeps, and the background of the buildings almost looks to me like, uh, you know, a very close-up shot of Berlin, you know, at the end of World War II. I mean, the building is damaged to that extent. It was a challenging night, a troubling night for Americans, African Americans across the country, many, uh, well, all probably were very upset, very angry, and, and should, should have been. You know, that's a healthy emotion. But a few of those and others took advantage of that moment and caused a lot of destruction, a lot of violence. Robert Kennedy was coming to Indianapolis that night uh, as a presidential candidate and had planned on making a campaign speech dedicating the campaign headquarters in Indianapolis, and all that changed, of course, when he found out that Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot. And in this moment, Robert Kennedy did something that very few politicians have ever done, and something that is quite rare today, and that is to speak from the heart uh, with compassion, uh, honesty, and a caring for all of his fellow Americans. Off the cuff, uh, when in most situations like that, a presidential candidate would, would not even show up. That event would have been canceled. And, and perhaps even today it would have been. Uh, after everything that was going down with the assassination of John F. Kennedy, our president, and a few years later now, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. No one would you know, criticize a candidate for not showing up 
in an inner city neighborhood. So it's a moment, I think, that is not born of politics, but born of pain. As a university professor for 37 years, in addition to making films, I would talk to students in a screenwriting class about the themes of motion pictures and, in fact, of all stories. You know. And I'd show them a list of 80 themes. It's almost an exhaustive list of themes that might be used in storytelling, written by an academician. And it was just kind of a, a reflection on these. And so there are all these categories. The first category I remember was survival themes, where you know, we need something like, you know, we need air and water and food. And so you think maybe of a disaster film or something with a theme of survival. Recently, um, George Clooney and Sandra Bullock were in a film called Gravity. I don't know if any of you saw that film, but they're in outer space without gravity and zero G. And this academician had not thought of that particular theme, hadn't thought of that one, interestingly enough. Uh, and there, there are other themes, the romantic relationship, you know, and here's a list of 10 sub-themes from that. Uh, the quest, the quest, which might include uh, like the Odyssey, the, the long journey home, uh, or might include the Lord of the Rings trilogy books and the motion pictures of the Lord of the Rings, uh, where we're in, in most quests like that, we're seeking to find something of great value, maybe the Holy Grail or whatever. But in the Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien turned that upside down. And instead of trying to find this thing of tremendous value, the films and the story was about getting rid of this thing, the reverse quest, kind of interesting. And I'd show students those, and I'd say, no, other people think there are only seven, seven themes. But when it comes down to it, I think there are only two two themes in storytelling, really. It all boils down to that, no matter what the genre or what this is about. Really about the two themes, uh, which, which are almost always present together, and that is love and fear. And when we're fearful, we typically become angry, even violent. And African Americans in that audience that night after Robert Kennedy's speech, uh, we're, we're before the speech and even perhaps to some extent afterward, they were fearful, right? Uh, imagine losing your leader, uh, being in a people group uh, that was largely voiceless, uh, persecuted against, experiencing racial prejudice all of your life, and here is someone who emerges, who is like you, who is doing great things and you can look up to him, and now he's gone. That's a fearful time. What's going to happen next? and that can lead to anger. Uh, and Robert Kennedy steps into that situation and actually uses words like love and compassion. And he gives the people a choice. We all have a choice. How do we respond to the challenges, the trauma that life gives us? How do we respond? Uh, do we yield to fear, which can turn to anger and possible violence, or do we attempt to turn to love, love and compassion? That's the essence of this film. Hope you find it meaningful. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephen Fagan. I'm the curator here at the museum, and I want to thank you for joining us for this conversation with Dr. Donald Boggs. Dr. Boggs, you were 15 years old when these events that we've just watched um, unfolded half a century ago. Let's start tonight by telling us a little bit about your 1968 experience. Civil rights and other issues. For me, 1968 was a... And I, you reflect back to that year, I, I think I was coming into my political awareness, you know, and having, you know, a better understanding of history and the context of things. And 1968 began, and as you saw in the film, the Tet Offensive in, in South Vietnam, which I vividly remember the images of uh, Viet Cong attacking the U.S. Embassy in Seoul, Korea, you know, in the heart of South Korea, or South of Vietnam, I'm sorry. And the, uh, the shock that everything we'd been told about the war and how well it was going was, was apparently not true. And then in uh, February, Lyndon Baines Johnson, our president, decided he was not going to run for re-election. That was very unusual, you know, to have a one-term president. And um, then in April, Martin Luther King's death, Robert Kennedy's death in June. Uh, 
the Chicago Convention, which you know erupted into violence in the streets and uh, some police brutality involved with that. And I found myself as a teenager just going, where, where am I living? What, what world is this? This is, <laughs> and I remember my childhood, and it was very good. It was a lot of fun. And here I am becoming an adult, and it seemed like the world was, was falling apart. It was not a good place to be. And I, I was very happy when Apollo 8 circled the moon at the end of that year in December. I mean, it was a huge, <sighs> you know, it's Christmas time, and something positive has happened. It was not a good place to be. And I, I was very happy when Apollo 8 circled the moon at the end of that year in December. I mean, it was a huge, <sighs> you know, it's Christmas time and something positive has happened. We, we've talked several times about your experiences growing up, your experiences in 1963 when President Kennedy was shot. You, you've mentioned to me that you had very little contact in your childhood with African Americans. You really didn't have any communication with them at all. But a year and a half after Dr. King was killed, in 1970, you experience something of an epiphany. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. I, I lived in a little village west of Akron, Ohio, called Norton. And there were no African Americans uh, you know, within miles. Of that, and, and that's just, that's where we lived, and this is the world I lived in. Every uh, you know student at school was white. We had a lot of Eastern Europeans, names like Turbovich and Monchalov, and that that seemed very normal to me. And my parents uh, spoke regularly about experiences with African Americans, and uh, seemed to be free from prejudice. You know, they instilled in me the values of all humans being children of God, equal. But I, I didn't know any African Americans. That was out of my experience base, and I uh, very naively assumed, that, you know, that you know these people are just like me. It's just a different skin color, uh, childhood thinking, I guess. And I was remember one of the highlights uh, in church for me as a youth was coming to Minneapolis in 1968 uh, for the National Youth Convention, and then again in 1970, uh, in the summer of 1970, that youth convention was here in Dallas, Texas. And that was my first trip to Dallas. And after coming back from that, we had a wonderful experience. One day in the fall, our youth minister came to us and said, you know, we had a great time at the youth convention. Yeah. Uh, did you know that the African American members of our church, nationally, internationally, have their own youth convention? And I was like, what? You know, what? Why would they need their own youth convention? And, you know, the answer was, uh, you know, although we, we have some churches that are racially mixed, the majority are not, and he said, uh, we would be welcome at this convention. I know, I've talked to people, they would welcome us coming to that convention, and given what's happening in civil rights in this country, I, I think we, some of us should do that. And uh, my friend Gary Gulkin and I looked at each other and thought, hey, what, what a great adventure that will be. We'll, we'll go to Atlanta, we'll have fun at a youth convention, and this will be interesting. And it was. Uh, we were the only two whites at that convention with about 2,000 African Americans. And it was a, for the first time in my life, although I didn't have the language to explain it, I realized this is not just a skin tone issue, this is a cultural Issue. But I, I didn't have those words. Uh, you know, I'm walking through the hotel, and everyone's being very nice, but uh, they're, they're really excited. And I came from this very low-key background, European background, where you, know, you were very controlled. Later in life, I learned it was better to express the, some of the emotions I had rather than bottle them up. And that, the beginning of learning that happened at that, that convention. Uh, and, and we did some other things. We, we did a, a tour of Martin Luther King locations that were important, Ebenezer Baptist Church. And I saw, for the first time in my life, uh, you know, a, a woman openly just weeping and wailing. And I said, wow, that's, that makes me uncomfortable. You know, I don't know why, but I'm un uncomfortable. That, that's, that's too much. You know, she should be more controlled than that. And I came out of that convention realizing these are all... Everyone I met was a wonderful person. You know, embraced our presence, seemed to be genuinely happy that we were there. 
And I, I think I committed every faux pas that I could have. We rode the bus down to the convention to Atlanta from Akron, Ohio, and Gary and I got on the bus, and uh, we, didn't, we didn't know anybody. And so what did we do? We sat in the front seat. You know, and, and 10 years later, I'm like, oh my gosh. But, you know, that's where I was. That's where many of us were at that time. And that convention gave me the opportunity to meet with loving people who were different from me. And they shared openly about who they were and what was of value and important to them. And that had an impact on me. And that, that really spurred me to do more international travel and to meet other people of different ethnicities and different cultures, different faiths, and push my horizon back significantly. When I got back to Norton High School, in homeroom, I was talking excitedly to the young woman behind me about this experience. And I said, you know, that there's, there's different, I don't know what, what to call it, but they're different. They're wonderful. But these things are different from the way we are. And she got very upset. She was very angry because, you know, she thought, she said, you're being, you're being prejudiced. Hmm. And I said, I don't think I'm being prejudiced. You know, I think I'm honestly seeing that there are differences. And I, I can embrace those differences as well. And I can learn from that. I can, I can, take what is wonderful about that that helps round me out as a person. But, but she didn't get it, I'm sure later. She, but she never had an experience. How could she? How could have I without that experience? Before we get away from that, that, that experience you had in Atlanta, tell us about the encounter that you had with the, the woman at the King site, because I think that's very telling. This is a year and a half after Dr. King has been killed. One around of and had her head down. And I took a picture. Of her. I thought it was a startling, beautiful picture and a, and a tribute on her part. And I don't know if, as she was getting up, she saw, maybe I had my camera up still, I don't know. But she came up to me, you know, just directly at me and took her fist and just started pounding on my chest. And I, I just kind of backed up as she's pounding and very quickly, uh, you know, a couple of ministers, you know, from the movement, you know, kind of grabbed her arms and gently pulled her away. And I, re I remember, you know, I'm uh, 17 years old at this point. I remember, you know, not really being offended uh, or even frightened, but just, you know, kind of like, wow, you know, this is that passion. This is, you know, I, I interpreted it as this love that she had, you know, for King. And I don't know if it was because I was white or if because I was taking a picture. I don't know, and it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, somehow I understood what was happening there, and it, it was okay. It was okay. You know, these ministers are going to help her, you know, wrestle with her emotions. And I, nothing has happened to me. I mean, I'm not injured. Right. I'm not worried about it. But it was a surprising, surprising moment. What led you to... Camera up still? I don't know. But she came up to me, you know, just directly at me and took her fist and just started pounding on my chest. And I, I just kind of backed up as she's pounding and very quickly, uh, you know, a couple of ministers, you know, from the movement, you know, kind of grabbed her arms and gently pulled her away. And I, re I remember, you know, I'm uh, 17 years old at this point. I remember you know, not really being offended uh, or even frightened, but just, you know, kind of like, wow. You know, this is that passion. This is, you know, I, I interpreted it as this love that she had, you know, for King. And I don't know if it was because I was white or if because I was taking a picture. I don't know, and it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, somehow I understood what was happening there, and it, it was okay. It was okay. You know, these ministers are going to help her, you know, wrestle with her emotions. And I, nothing has happened to me. I mean, I'm not injured. Right. I'm not worried about it. But it was a surprising, surprising moment. What led you to a ripple of hope? Uh, I had lived in within about uh, 25 miles of the site of the speech. And had never been there. Again, there was no reason for me. It was in a part of Indianapolis that I did not travel through, going to the places I would go to. I'd never heard of the speech, never seen the site. And uh, Time Magazine 
in one issue had an excerpt from the first chapter of Joe Klein's book, Politics Lost. And his purpose in writing this book, Politics Lost, was to uh, relate uh, his grief at the loss of American politicians being open, honest, and uh, I guess freely speaking to the American people. It came out of the 2004 presidential election where candidates like uh, Al Gore were using phrases that we heard again and again and again, phrases that had been carefully tested probably and written. Uh, what are we going to do about Social Security? We're going to put that in a lockbox and protect And I heard lockbox so many times. And Joe Klein is saying, you know, the stakes are so high, everything's being recorded, no one's feeling free to speak. And he opened his book and closed his book with Robert Kennedy's speech in Indianapolis, citing it as the last time that an American politician spoke extemporaneously to the American people. And I read that first chapter, and I was like, wow. I'm a communication person. I'm a storyteller. I've never heard this story. How could I not have heard of this? And I found it very compelling. And then I set the magazine down and moved on to everything else that needed to be done day after day. And, and every month or two, I would remember this. And you know, I'd think about it, set it aside, and a few months later, this happened three or four times, and finally I said to myself, OK, I think this is um, what the Bible calls the still small voice. And I, I need to start listening. So uh, in a winter December of 2006, I went down to Indianapolis uh, by myself and went to the park and saw the sculptures that we see at the end of this film and talked to some people there in the neighborhood and said, you know, I wonder if there's a, a documentary that's been made on this. Has this story ever been told? And everything I found on the web was very two-dimensional, very simplistic. And I knew there was more and um, researched to see if there was film available and there was, it had to be put together and were there witnesses? Uh, I wanted to include not just, you know, the typical uh, national leaders and staff people that we see in documentaries, but also everyday people in Indianapolis who had been at that speech to see what they thought. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the audience, and the audience is what matters. And uh, there were people available, and so we began April 4th, 2007, and premiered it April 4th, 2008. And, and it's worth noting that a number of students at the university contributed to this film, students who obviously were not alive in 1968, were right. approaching this as what we call here non-rememberers. What was it like to work with those students on a project like this? You know, it was very interesting. Uh, this was done through Anderson University, where I was a professor at the time. And the students, we probably had a dozen students that first day we shot, April 4th, 2007, because there's an annual commemoration in Indianapolis. And they were all walking, in addition to helping shoot uh, the piece, which we never used, never used any of that, they were walking around with clipboards that said on one side in big letters, if you were here April 4th, 1968, please talk to me. And so we got names and addresses, and that was where we, we began to find people who had been there. Uh, you know, they were amazing. They worked in all kinds of capacities as they were able. Um, given their experience, and some higher than others. But I had a, an African-American student who was with us on the interview in Washington, D.C. with John Lewis. And she would have been 20 years old at the time we shot this. And, you know, John Lewis is amazing. The interview is I mean, he's amazing in the film. Wow. And so we, did, we waited, we set up an hour took us to set up, and we waited an hour and a half, not knowing if he was going to be able to make it because of uh, duties in the House of Representatives. And he came in, and we, we had 30 minutes, which went to 45 or 50 minutes. And we stepped out, we, we struck everything, stepped out in the hallway, and I turned to Don Dina, and she was on her phone talking to her mother about what she had just experienced with John Lewis. Yeah. And her mother uh, was, didn't quite get it. And she said, just a second, let me let you talk to your grandmother. Her grandmother got it. Yeah. You know, there was an age difference there. Her grandmother had experienced you know, the 30s and 40s and 50s and the 60s. And uh, oh, I mean, I, you know, thanks to Facebook, Don Dean and I reconnected. She sent me a note you know, just a couple months ago 
remarking on what an experience that was for her. And I'm so pleased that she was able to be part of that. For the individuals interviewed who were there in the crowd that night in Indianapolis, you, you approached their interviews in a unique way. You were asking them to recall, really off the top of their head, words that were spoken 40 years earlier. Right. But then you did something towards the end of the interview. Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting because I, I think uh, one of those persons says, I don't, you know, I, I may not get the words exactly right. right. Everyone came right back with words that Kennedy spoke just as though they were the words. And they weren't the words, but they were close. I mean, it was, it was like someone had paraphrased. Put, and they'd, they'd taken that message and put them in their own words. But at the end of an interview, uh, I think most interviewers always ask an open-ended question. Because we, we're throwing a, a, a fishnet into the lake or the sea, and we don't know what fish are out there. We don't know what we don't know. And so we'll say, typically, is there anything else that that I've, something that I've overlooked or that uh, you think is important or, or just something you'd like to share. And often people will say something. And with those that were at the speech, I went a step further. I had an audio recording of the speech that I put on my telephone and I had a little speaker hooked up to it. And I would say, uh, you were there uh, you know, 39 years ago. I have a recording of the speech. Would it be okay if I played it? And all but one person said yes, that would be fine. And so, you know, my cinematographer would continue to record, and I would play that for them. It lasted about six and a half minutes. And then at the end of that, I would just uh, push the button and go. And there'd be a moment or two of silence, and then the feelings would come. That that recording jogged memories. It. It, uh, it hit people effectively. And so that, uh, one of the last sound bites in there from John Lewis, where he says, I was uh, there that night, standing nearby when Robert Kennedy spoke those words. And you can see the tear in his eye. That was after I played that. He had not heard that right. since 1968. Mm -hmm. And it's just very powerful what memories that, that invokes. If you have any questions for Dr. Boggs, if you'll um, write them down on these cards here, we'll come and collect them and go through a few of those. You have screened, this, this documentary came out in 2009, I believe. 2008. The, 2008. You've screened it all over the country. It's been seen around the world. Um, you've gotten a number of interesting reactions to this, and there's one in particular mm -hmm. that I want you to talk about. It's the firefighter okay. from Indianapolis. Sure. Tell us about that. Yeah. You know, um, Traditionally in filmmaking, outside of a live premiere, you, you just, you don't hear, or you didn't, you didn't used to hear from people. And now with the internet, you can, if you care to, you can read reviews. Some of those have been interesting. There have been a few uh, racist reviews on some sites, that, that Netflix, that so were taken down, which, you know, kind of surprised me. But uh, we had a wonderful moment, unexpected, at uh, the Heartland Film Festival in Indianapolis in 2008, where the film was screened. It was shown probably five times. And I was standing outside one of the cinema after the screening, and a, a gentleman, probably in his late 70s, came up to me. And he said, uh, I, need to, I need to speak with you. And I said, okay, I don't know what's coming. And he said, I'm a retired firefighter uh, in Indianapolis. And he kind of hesitated, and then he said, for 40 years, I have carried an enormous amount of anger and prejudice against African Americans. Uh, you know, I was so angry. I've been so angry. And, you know, I'm angry because, uh, you know, when there were riots, they were putting my friends, my companions, my firefighter friends in danger. I'm like, oh, okay, I get this. You know, there's arson and fires are being set, and now firefighters, his friends are having to go in and deal with this. It's like, yeah, I, I can see that. And he says, you know, for 40 years I've carried that, and today I have, tonight I've let that go. He said, I don't, I don't condone what, what happened. I don't condone that. He said, but for the first time in my life, I understand why that happened. And I've given that up tonight. And I was like, oh my gosh. 
it's rare that you do something in this profession that changes someone at that level. And it was, you know, it, it's not anything you could ever expect. It's just the, the truth of the story and of that moment in Indianapolis. We have a few questions here from the audience. <clears throat> Why do you think uh, RFK referred to JFK as a member of his family rather than his brother? Well, that's speculation. Uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to give informed speculation. I think the reason for that is, uh, I guess I'd suggest that each of us put ourselves in, in a position like that, where you know, just a few years ago we suffered the loss of someone who was extraordinarily close to us. And in Robert Kennedy's case, someone that he felt responsible for you know, brother protector, uh, being JFK's attorney general and campaign manager in 1960 and doing these things. I, 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 I wonder if he could have even uttered the word brother. Hmm. I, I'm not sure he could have. I think he had to distance himself from that as he talked about it, as we often do. When we talk about painful things, sometimes we talk around them in some ways. Can you uh, tell us some more about the statue in Indianapolis, how long it's been there? Not much. Uh, my, my focus was the, was the story. The statue went up uh, when Bill Clinton was president and was uh, designed by a local artist and then executed by a national sculptor whose name I cannot uh, give you. He did some sculpture uh, of uh, Hillary Clinton, I think, maybe Madonna. Hmm. Kind of edgy. Maybe that rings a bell with someone, I don't know. But this is a different style yeah. from what he's usually done, uh, but that's because it was designed by someone in Indianapolis. And it's, it's King and Kennedy reaching out to each other uh, with space for people to walk underneath, and yet those hands not quite touching. And you can't quite, I can't reach them, I've got a, quite the wing spread but I can't, uh, I can't reach them either. So. This is an interesting question. It kind of gets to a story that you told me about an encounter you had at the Paley Center when the documentary was screened mm -hmm. there. Uh, the Robert Kennedy who gave this speech is the same Robert Kennedy who, as Attorney General, authorized the FBI to bug and mm -hmm. wiretap Dr. King. Sure. Uh, the, the question is, were there two different Robert Kennedys, or was there an evolution in the man? Well, I think... Uh, one of the things I learned teaching at the university was uh, sometimes uh, alumni would come back 10 years later and greet me, and they were different. You know, I had this snapshot in my head of the last time I saw them, and in, some, in a few cases it was like, whew, glad they graduated. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be done with that student. And then 10 years later they come back, and that's where I still am, but they, they've moved. And I didn't realize that, and I'm like, oh, wow, this is great. Uh, I, you know, we're all complicated people, right? And I think there's uh, that, and I think there's also that evolution. We all hopefully are growing. We're moving in the right, you know, the right direction. In that case, uh, you may know the background better than I do, Stephen, but uh, it was J. Edgar Hoover who really pushed for those. He had a commanding presence, and, you know, Kennedy may have felt like he had to trust the director, you know, the FBI, I think later those phone taps were reduced. But to come back to uh, the Paley Center, uh, we premiered this in New York City at the Paley Center. Kerry Kennedy and Rory Kennedy, children of Robert Kennedy, were there. Jeff Greenfield was there as well. Uh, he was a CNN uh, a reporter at the time. And he was a campaign staffer for Robert Kennedy at the age of 25. He was one of the young Turks, they called them. And the evening of the speech in Indianapolis, Robert Kennedy went back to the Marat Hotel and met with African-American leaders from the city. It was a very tense time. There was a lot of anger, rightly so. And uh, Kennedy hung with that for about an hour. And then he was going by staffers' rooms. And Jeff Greenfield and Adam Walensky were to be writing the speech the next night for Cleveland. And they, I guess they had finished that, or a first draft at least. And Kennedy came into Jeff Greenfield's room at the Marat 
to find him laying on the bed with his clothes on, asleep. And Robert Kennedy pulled out the blanket from underneath him and covered him with the blanket. And that awakened Jeff Greenfield. And Greenfield looked up at Kennedy, and this was related to me by Jeff, looked up at Bob Kennedy and said, you're not so ruthless after all. <laughs> and Bobby Kennedy went, don't tell anyone. So yeah. We're running a little short on time, so we're going to sure. do one more question. But it, it, it speaks to something I wanted to ask. But anyway, this came out 10 years ago, 2008. Right. We lived in a very different world yeah. at that time. Mm -hmm. You told me earlier you felt that when it came out in 2008, in the middle of an election year, first African-American candidate running for president, that it felt extremely relevant. And yet here we are in 2018, and it feels perhaps even more relevant. Uh, the question is, how do you compare our current state of race relations uh, to where we were in 1968? I, I find myself confused. And I think the same is true for uh, women's rights. I, I, I seriously find myself at a loss. Um, I'm, I'm troubled by what I've seen and in, in recent years, and in both those areas, really. Uh, and I don't, I don't know, you know, it's like, has this been, this degree of prejudice and racism been latent, hidden away? And now some people feel safe to do some things that they didn't before. Uh, they feel they have a license to do that in some extent. Uh, if so, I, I guess I'm glad I, I found out because I thought we were moving, moving along. Uh, but that, that journey to uh, you know, true equality you know, seems to be a long one and a challenging one. And you know, I, the older I am, the more aware I am of, the, um, of my own status as a white person, as a male, as, a, as an educated, well-educated person, as a tall person. I mean, that may seem silly, but you know, I, what, the presidents, between, in presidential elections, the taller person has almost always won, I think. Uh, having my voice, the voice that, that I had nothing to do with, that was given to me, you know, all those things have uh, given me a, a much more privileged place. And, uh, you know, doing this film is, is something that, uh, you know, I did to try to deal with that, try to pay back, I guess, in some ways. But, but it's disturbing. I think it's more relevant than ever before. Um, and I particularly appreciate Robert Kennedy's model of uh, saying, yeah, this, the, these are the two situations. Here's, here's the choice. And I'm recommending you know, love and compassion and respect and, and these values that um, hopefully most of us are striving for. I think you know, Robert Kennedy used that term vast majority, I think, three times three or four times yeah. in the film, at, at Muncie, at Ball State, and in Indianapolis. And it's almost, I don't, I don't know that that was true. It's almost as though he was willing it to be and shaping, helping to shape that audience to make it so in that, in that group. I don't know. I'm discouraged by where things are. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. A ripple of hope. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for sharing that remarkable film with us tonight. Thank you, everybody.